All right, folks, welcome back. Um, here we are into the second week. We're going to be shifting into Egyptian art at this point. And to begin with, in the PowerPoint on Chapter 3 from Gardeners, uh, we're going to look at Map 3.1. And this is going to be the main area and region that we're going to dissect in regards to Egyptian art. We're going to have four, or I'm sorry, three main time periods, and then there's going to be a pre-dynastic period um, leading up to these three main periods. So there's going to be A, the pre-dynastic, okay, before B, the old kingdom, Egypt, C, the middle kingdom, Egypt, and D, the new kingdom, Egypt. And during this pre, the A, the pre-dynastic period, we're going to see a development of what are called Egyptian canons. And another word for canons is a standardization. And what the Egyptians are going to do is they're going to pull upon these standards or these canons to keep their artwork very consistent. They're going to detour from it a little bit, but not much. And the reason that they keep it consistent is for really spiritual reasons in that they believe, just like the Mesopotamians did, that their rulers are divine human rulers sent down from a heavenly or a, an afterworld. And so they believe that whatever sculpture that represents the Pharaoh and the queen, that's with the Pharaoh, will be the ideal form, I-D-E-A-L form, that the Pharaoh and the queen will take on in the afterworld. And they also believe that the Pharaoh still resides spiritually in the area in which they were buried. And they remain to assist future Pharaohs and future rulers of Egypt. So everything that we see in these Egyptian canons, C-A-N-O-N-S, are to represent the ideal form that they want the Egyptian pharaohs, kings, and queens to have in their afterlife, in the afterworld or the netherworld. Okay, and this will also coincide with the way in which they're buried in the tombs. They'll begin with what are called mastaba tombs, M-A-S-T-A-B-A, -A, mastaba tombs, which are more buried in the ground, and then they'll elevate them into the pyramids. And then it will be um, kind of a combination of the two well, where the temple will be burled into the side of a mountain, which will happen in the middle kingdom. And then they'll elevate them again later on in the new kingdom. So there will, it will go through some, some different patterns of burial but those Egyptian canons will pretty much stay the same. It will alter just a little bit when there's time of strife and there's more emotions that are going on during the Middle Kingdom in particular. But Old Kingdom and then back into the New Kingdom, you're going to see those Egyptian canons really hold strong and anchor down this period from pre-dynastic all the way up to New Kingdom. So map 3.1 is going to show you Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. And this area is considered the southern tip of the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent originated up into ancient Mesopotamia, and the bottom of that crescent moon shape reaches all the way down to Egypt. And these are areas that were very fertile and very much alive in abundance with vegetation, as well as animal husbandry and animal domestication. The lower Egyptian area was known for its agriculture, and the lower is actually the northern part. We call it the lower because that's the entryway of the delta from the, of the Nile River coming out of the Mediterranean Sea. Though it's up to the north, it's considered the lower because it's the origins of the Nile. Then down to the south is the upper, and the upper Egyptian area is known for more animal hunting and domestication. So those two areas are the main regional locations of Egypt. And what's going to happen very much like with the ancient Mesopotamians 
is there's going to be multiple little city states multiple little groups and there's not really going to be a dynasty or a kingdom at first but then if you look at figure 3.2 there's going to be the advent of a dynasty the beginnings of a dynasty the precursors to the pharaohs the precursor to the old kingdom and that's going to be with the palette of king narmir and the palette of king narmir is the beginnings of where we're going to start to see these egyptian canons the first is going to be use of hieroglyphics hieroglyphics will be the first canon and the hieroglyphics that are present on the palette of king narmir figure 3.2 are going to be right above the crown of his head he's the central figure and above him is a salmon image and a chisel like a chisel with a hammer those two combined mean narmir so hieroglyph hieroglyphically when you see the salmon in combination with the chisel in that orientation that means we're talking about narmir then narmir himself is very large in comparison to all the other figures upon the palette on this side and that size difference where he towers over essentially everyone even the opponent that he has made surrender down to the ground that height where the pharaoh is much larger than everybody else in the composition or everybody else within the register that's breaking up the different piece of artwork that largest scale is called a hierarchical scale hierarchical scale and what you will see is that everybody in the upper epsilon or of highest status in that society will be really large and then everybody else will be subsequently a little bit shorter a little bit smaller so that's the second canon is the use of hierarchical scale the third is the use of simple forms simple geometric forms a little bit of blockiness in the body not a lot of really organic or naturalistic curves and turns and depth it's going to be simple block slightly blocky and geometric in nature simplicity they're just trying to represent an ideal form using simple geometric shapes kind of mathematical in nature they're not looking at trying to create an identical figure based off of nature because if there were any blemishes or any nuances that were uncomfortable to the pharaoh those would not be included in the imagery or the sculptures of the pharaoh so they use simple forms to address this ideal i-d-e-a-l representation on what that king in this case with king narmir or the future pharaohs would look like in the afterlife the fourth is going to be represented with a leg moving forward that leg moving forward may at first seem like a element of kinetics or animation with the figure the main figure in particular the pharaoh or the king but if any of you try to stand like that with one leg forward and flat-footed and one leg back back flat-footed without your body shifting forward and it being completely erect to your upper torso it's not really possible you would need like an extension of two to three inches on your back foot so symbolically that left leg forward is the next canon and it represents their movement into the afterworld so we'll see sculptures and images of pharaohs and kings and queens that are going to have that leg forward that represents that canon of stepping into the afterworld and the idea that everything that they're doing is preparation for the afterworld two more things the last two is profile you're going to see most of the image in profile you're not going to see a lot of frontal imagery it's going to be mostly in profile so you're going to see the side of the face but you're not really going to see the depth of the face on the other side it's going to stay pretty strictly profile 
And the last is that archaic smile. There's going to be an archaic smile, which is a smile of constant content, unaffected and unmoved by emotions. So those are your six canons. And we're going to address all of those canons throughout this, uh, throughout this video. But before we go on, I want to show you the other side, which is figure 3.3 on that same palette. And in figure 3.3 and 3.2, this steely is showing King Narmir's attempt to unify the upper and lower Egyptian areas. So it's his attempt as a king to unify all of Egypt. So the beginnings of the dynasties of the Egyptian pharaohs. And how we know that are a few things. One is the hieroglyphics on the top on 3.3 as well as 3.2 with the salmon and the chisel are both in the center at the top, which means the front and the back are both about King Narmir. Then the second component is if you look at figure 3.3, the second register and the large figure to the left, that's King Narmir. Again, that hierarchical scale. And he's much larger than everybody else. But he has a different crown on, on this side than he does on figure 3.2. So figure 3.3, that crown with a little bit of a curl on the top is the crown of Lower Egypt. And then the crown that he wears on figure 3.2, which is the pointy top, almost like a bowling pin, is the crown of the upper Egyptian area. So the pointy crown is the upper Egyptian area, and then the curled crown is the lower Egyptian area. So for us, that is evidence that he's unifying the two regions of Egypt. Then lower on figure 3.3, there are two feline heads that are like creating this Mobius strip. They're intertwining one another. And that, again, is an indicator of unification of two different regions. And he's pacifying the upper and lower regions and starting to unify Egypt and turning it into one kingdom, which is what he does. And that's where Old Kingdom begins. Now, before Old Kingdom, uh, most of these kings were buried and these, and these rulers were buried in what are called mastabas, so figure 3-4. And you can see what a mastaba tomb looks like. You can see that they're buried straight down into the earth, and then there's a shrine and a chapel that is part of the, um, the building blocks of what will soon become the Egyptian pyramids. There's a shrine in there, and there's a sculpture in there that represents the burial of that king or of that ruler. So these are the beginning entrances into the tomb, uh, the, the Egyptian pyramid tombs that will be used for burying the pharaohs. And if you notice, number two, there's a false door. The false door is supposed to evade the invaders. Uh, so it's set in a way where it looks like that's the entrance, but it actually takes you all the way across the Mastaba tomb to the other side. And it prevents you from finding the riches and anything that's buried with the king. So whatever's buried with the king goes with the king. All right, that, that goes for any gold, any jewelry, any ornamentation. So these are the precursors to the pyramids. And a lot of the family members of the, of the pharaohs in the future will have these mastaba tombs built around the pyramids. Okay. So let's get to the pyramids. We have, we have figure 3.8. Figure 3.8 are the beginnings of the Egyptian pyramids. And the one in the very far back is um, <clears throat> Khufu, Pharaoh Khufu. Then the one in the middle is Pharaoh Khafre. And the one closest to us that is of larger size is Pharaoh Minkori. And this is how they decided to create the burial chambers for these first pharaohs after the pre-dynastic period. So when you see figure 3.8, that is going to be the beginnings of the Old Kingdom Egypt. Old Kingdom. So now Egypt is officially unified. 
And you can see that the pyramids get subsequently uh, smaller. The one in the very back is much bigger of Khufu. And the one in the middle is a little bit smaller and the one in the front in the foreground in front of what are called the stepped pyramids. There's three little step pyramids and that's Minkoris. And if you look at diagram 3.9, you can see how these pharaohs and the queens of these pharaohs were buried. There's a little deterrent, uh, number seven, which is the false tomb chamber, because the Mastaba tombs prior to this, the raiders and the looters and the thieves believed that they found that the kings and such were buried in the ground, right? If you go back at the diagram of the Mastaba tombs, they were buried in the ground. So when they developed these pyramids, they developed a false tomb chamber and they led the thieves for a while down into these depths that had nothing in them. And they actually elevated into the center, just south of the center of the pyramid where the Pharaoh was buried with the queen. And there was lots of gold and lots of very precious materials that were buried along with the Pharaoh. And again, these are going to be elements that they're going to use in the afterlife. The tools, the ornamentation, all of it, the crowns, all of the riches and wealth are going to go with them. So you can kind of see the diagram on how they were buried and be able to know and research and be able to point out these different elements in figure 3.9. Be able to track out the different numbers and it's all located there for you all right and then also what's really interesting about the engineering of this temple or of this pyramid is number eight they have compression stones so as things expand and contract with the with the stone that's being used for the pyramids it prevents any pressure coming down on number five the king's chamber so that the body of the pharaoh is not distorted or um, damaged in any way. Those are the main areas I want you to know is number eight, number five, and number seven. Okay. And figure 310 just kind of shows you an aerial vision of what it looks like, what Giza looks like with uh, what's called a causeway. So know what the causeway is, which is number four uh, from the Great Sphinx in the front. Um, of the causeway leading all the way back to Khafre's um, pyramid. And that causeway is a place of um, worship and offering where the priest will go and take the offerings to the pyramid to give to the Pharaoh in his afterlife so they can eat. And also the causeway is a place where the Pharaoh gets to go back and forth and give suggestions and help the future Egyptians with their needs as an ancestor. So the pharaohs are supposed to still be present, helping in a spiritual sense, all that is going on in Egypt. So then we have the Great Sphinx. And the Great Sphinx was made around the same time as Khafre's temple or the Khafre's uh, pyramid. And the Great Sphinx is really important in regards to a few of the Egyptian canons. One is the use of the archaic smile, showing this content equiposed, unaffected, unemotional look of rigidity and also content, happiness, and also the simplicity of form. They're using very simple geometric block shapes to design the overall body of the Sphinx. So you have simplicity of form is an Egyptian canon and you have the archaic smile, which is an Egyptian canon. And then another thing I wanna mention with the first canon of the simplicity of form is symmetry. The Egyptians will be very much interested in symmetry, which is whatever looks like on one side needs to reflect on the other side, on the left side or on the right side. <clears throat> now, the reason that the Sphinx is a hybrid is to show ferociousness, uh, to show fierceness as well as humanism, to show if you need to be fierce or if you need to be merciful. So the head of the Sphinx is a merciful Pharaoh. And then the body of the Sphinx is this aggressive, fierce lion like form that could pounce at any time. So it's a beacon of mercy as well as fierceness. 
So if they needed to be aggressive, they they would. But if they needed if they needed to be mercy, they would as well. So it just depended on what was needed at the time. And you can see that in Figure three twelve with Coffrey enthroned. His hands. His right hand is a fist. His left hand is a flat hand. The left hand shows mercy. The right hand shows aggression. Whatever is necessary for the rule of the pharaoh. You have the symmetry on both sides with the headdress. You have the blockiness of the form. Very simplistic form. Very simplistic shape. So that's a canon. You also have the archaic smile, which is a canon upon his face. Just a slight little smile. We don't see hierarchical scale. We do not see one leg forward. We do see some hieroglyphics on the side of the throne. So those are the main canons that you're going to observe in figure 312, Khafre enthroned. Now remember that this enthronement sculpture is a representation on what Khafre is supposed to look like ideally in the afterworld. So if anything gets broken or is deteriorated, that could affect his body, his spiritual body, in the afterworld. So it was really important that they were kept sacred and protected. Then in figure 313, we have Minkori and Karamerenimiti. And here we can see a heightened level of Egyptian cannons being used. The symmetry in his body, with both arms down to the side, thumbs facing forward, and then also the symmetry in his headdress, very even. No asymmetry, very even, very symmetrical. The different features of his body are very geometric and simple in shape. For example, if you look at his patellas or his kneecaps, they're almost like little cubes. And there's a little parabola that bends down around it, like the, the muscle or in the skin that will come down and drape over the top of your patella or your, your kneecap as you're walking forward. His upper body is triangulated, very geometric in nature. His head is geometric and triangulated as well, from the tip of the beard all the way up to the top sections of his headdress creates another triangle. His ears are symmetrical. His eyes are symmetrical. His mouth has the archaic smile, and so does hers. Another canon is the legs moving forward. Look at his left leg and look at her left foot. They're both shifting forward. Again, an advent of showing that symbolism of walking into the afterworld. And she's going along with him because of her embrace, because the way that she has her hands around him. So where he goes, she will follow. Her body, on the other hand, is less rigid and is more conical or more cylinder-like. Even in her hair, it has a cylinder, like a half cylinder-like shape. So you're going to get more of a curvaceous feature with the feminine form and you're going to have more of a rigidity or more of a rigid shape whenever it comes to the pharaoh's form. But this is how Menkori and Karanamrati are going to be represented in the afterworld and this is their enshrined sculpture within Giza in the Menkori pyramid. So again, be able to know those canons. Go back, refer to the beginning of the video in regards to knowing those canons. And we can contrast that with figure 314, which is a seated scribe. And the seated scribe is not a pharaoh. It is not a queen. He has importance, and there's a sculpture designed about his, his inscriptions of hieroglyphics, and thus the sculpture is made. But you can see there's a vast difference between figure 314 and figure 313 and be able to compare and contrast how 314, the seated scribe, has more organic and more true naturalistic features because he's not a pharaoh. He's not going into the afterworld. He has his direct identification present in the sculpting of the sculpture. I don't mean to sound redundant. He has the folded shoulder, you know, great, you know, just the, the rounded shoulders, a little bit of a belly, a little bit of a true kind of nature of what the what that person might have looked like. He's got a slightly off, uh, not, not quite symmetrical ears, not quite symmetrical face, 
Um, it's more about the detail and naturalistic, realistic definitions of the scribe. And a scribe is one who writes. So he's the one who's writing the hieroglyphs on behalf of the pharaoh. So he works for the pharaoh and has a very important position, hence the sculpture that's being made of him, but he's not going to be placed inside of any of the temples or inside of any of the pyramids because he's not going to the afterworld with the pharaoh. The pharaoh goes with the queen and that's it. And anything that's offered to him that's placed inside of the tomb. But you can see that there is a contrast. And also notice it's painted. Because of the limestone, which is a cheaper stone, um, it holds the paint. And you can see that these actually were originally painted. So figure 313, if you go back, they were painted, just like figure 314 is. But because of the higher quality stone that was used with Minkori and Kamarabati in figure 313, that paint just kind of shaled off. It shivered off. It didn't last. But it did with the limestone of the seated scribe because it's more porous. Excuse me. Then in figure 315, which is a relief carving, specifically it's called sunken relief because the outside hard black contour that you see on the figures, it's actually carved. They use a carving tool and carve into the limestone. And this is Ty watching a hippopotamus hunt. And Ty is one of the family members that was buried in one of the Mastaba tombs. And Ty obviously is much larger than everyone else. So that's that hierarchical scale, one of the canons. There's also hieroglyphics in the very bottom register, the very bottom section underneath the hippos in the water. So that's another canon. He has an archaic smile. There's a third canon. His leg is moved forward. There's a fourth canon. His body is made of very simple geometric shapes, rectangles, as well as triangles. Right? That's the fifth canon. All right. Let's see. Did I miss any on that? I feel like I did. Oh, yeah. He's in profile. <laughs> So he's mostly in profile. His upper body, his chest is more frontal, but most of his body is in profile, his head especially, and his feet. So the head and the feet are going to become very important elements of representation of these pharaohs as well as the family members of the pharaoh. Okay. And then I have more videos up that you can refer to as well on YouTube in regards to Middle Kingdom and uh, Old Kingdom, but I'm going to quickly breeze through that here in just a few minutes. So when you see Figure 317, you're going to be in, in you're going to be introduced to the Middle Kingdom, Egypt. And during this time, for about 400 years, there's going to be a lot of infighting, and there's not going to be one kingdom. All right, there's going to be little small kingdoms, little factions. And so whenever you see the head of Sinaracit the third, that's going to be the intro to the Middle Kingdom. And you'll notice that there's more realistic features upon the pharaoh in regards to this, the, the head of this sculpture. And the reason that there's more naturalistic features, like I mentioned, is when there's strife and there's battle and there's conflict in society, emotions have a tendency to be on the rise and they find their way into the artwork. And this is one example of it. So we will see more realistic features present here at the beginning of the Middle Kingdom, but we'll slowly move out of it, and then we'll move back into it with the New Kingdom. Because in the New Kingdom, they're going to refer back to these emotional looks and these more um, individualized, realistic looks, and they'll place that upon the New Kingdom pharaohs. But it's because of infighting that's creating these emotional interests that are now starting to play out in this in the uh, in the artwork of Middle Kingdom Egypt, and that's what Figure 317 is representing with the cheekbones, the skin, the dimples. Not so much an archaic smile; it's more of kind of a grave frown, slightly frowned, more grave, less content. All right, more focused with the eyes. So emotion is stepping in. And another thing, if you look at figure 318, 
319 and 320 is you have the tombs. And the tombs during the Middle Kingdom are going to be burled into the side of a hill or in a mountain. There's not going to be a pyramid and there's not going to be a burial in the ground. It's going to be carved into the side of a mountain. So be able to differentiate and know that figure 318, 319, and 320 are going to be the Middle Kingdom tombs that differentiate from the Mastaba tombs and the pyramids that we saw in Old Kingdom and in the pre-Dynastic period. So there's a big temple shift that's going on in the Middle Kingdom. Okay? Then figure 321 Hatshepsut, who is the first uh, female pharaoh, is going to bring back those Egyptian canons. The symmetry, the simplicity of form, the balance, the blockier shapes, the archaic smile, the hieroglyphics. Okay, The hieroglyphics were always there, which you can see in the tombs whenever you go through 318 to 320, specifically 319. You'll see the hieroglyphics there. In the narrations of the images but she's going to bring bring back all of these uh, a lot of these different canons but one thing that's going to change is there's not going to be as much focus on one leg moving forward into the afterworld a lot of these feral sculptures are now going to be rested upon their knees they're going to be kneeling okay they're not going to be standing erect with one leg going forward. They're going to be kneeling. So the emotional things have changed in regards to how the pharaohs are seen as rigid. There's more of an androgyny that's going to start to develop, kind of a balance between feminine and masculine energies. And a lot of that's going to have to do with, again, the emotional infighting that happened during Middle Kingdom, as well as Hatshepsut. Hatsh, <clears throat> bringing back the canons and fusing the importance of the feminine element as the pharaoh into the future pharaohs and we'll see that whenever we get to the new kingdom and i'm sorry real quick when you see the sculpture of in 321 of um hatshepsut that's your indicator that we're now moving back into new kingdom we're moving into, not back into, we're moving into New Kingdom Egypt. Okay, so figure 321. And what's going to be derivative from figure 321 is going to be... <clears throat> figure 329. Akhenaten. Akhenaten. And Akhenaten is going to be very reflective of what we saw with uh, Hatshepsut. You can see that he's kneeling, he's upon his knees. There's still the canons there, there's the hieroglyphics, there's the balance of form, there is uh, the simplicity of shape and the symmetry and the smile that's archaic in nature, but it's very rounded, he has a little belly, um, his arms are crossed, there's a lot of volume and there's not so much rigidity. There's more liveliness to the shape. So there's more emotion that's present with the overall form. And there's not this standing tall and erect and overpowering with a sense of hierarchy. There's different, definitely more of a feminine playfulness that's involved in the overall shape of the Pharaoh. So those big changes have happened. Um, and you can also see it very much with figure 330 with Nefertiti. Nefertiti, this is a sculpture of she. It's not quite finished, but there's an emphasis on all of her features. There's an emphasis on her long neck, her elongated face, and the rounded uh, features of her embodiment upon her face in this case. So it's less, there's less of an interest in the ideal shape, and it's more about the individualized shape. So the new kingdom is going to represent more of the interest in the individual than the ideal. 
and figures 329, 330, as well as 331, the mother of Akhenaten, are all three representing individuality. So he made the choice that Akhenaten um, <clears throat> made the choice to no longer represent himself as the pharaoh, his queen Nefertiti, as well as his mother, Tia, the portrait of Tia in 331, as ideal forms. They felt that their embodiment were already ideal enough. So they wanted to be represented individually. So that's why the sculptures have definitely way more detail and they're way more realistic. Again, figures 329, 330, and 331. Please refer back to the third video that I had already put up on YouTube to help elaborate a little bit more on these sculptures. Then lastly, I want to leave you with figure 332 and it's a relief carving using that sunken relief technique and this is Akhenaten and Nefertiti with their three daughters and you can see how large they are yes the children are often portrayed smaller but even if they stood up they would almost tower to nine or eight feet tall in relation to these young daughters that may be you know three and a half be tall by this time so again a little bit of the hierarchical scale excuse me is present and if that's not enough evidence for you if he stood up versus if she stood up he would tower over her even more so so again his importance as pharaoh was greater than that of queen nefertiti so the hierarchical scales there the sunken relief, which is that hard shadow line where the figure's been carved out. The hieroglyphics are there. The archaic smiles are there. The simplicity of form, though it's a little more organic now. And then also the profile. So those canons are back, but they're a little more emotional. They're a little more free-flowing, a little more organic, if you will. But they are still present. So I'll leave you with that, and I want you to go back and look at that third video that I already presented on YouTube for another class, and I want you to look back at figures 3.29, 3.30, and 3.31, and listen a little bit more about 3.32, and then there's a brief discussion on figure 3.37. So if you could, go back and watch that third installment of Egyptian art and learn about those through those videos. All right, thank you.